Fix this. Get everyone worldwide to fix this. In my old industry there were multiple entities involved in each transaction. Customers would make a request via a terminal, which would connect to an acquiring entity, which would connect to a network, which would connect to an issuing entity, who would respond. The response would flow back down to the terminal. The customer would then complete their transaction and go on about their business. All of this combined should take 5 to 10 seconds. Okay. What time did this happen? Typically the important time is the one from the customer's point of view. If they looked at their watch, what did it display? Unless a user made a manual note of the transaction, they would need to rely upon what was printed on the ticket or what they saw later in their account. What was printed on the ticket was almost always set to the local time for the terminal. If that was a physical terminal, then the user would have been standing in front of it. And their watch would have matched the ticket. However, it was important to keep in mind that the ticket the user received was created and printed by a mechanism distinct from the process I mentioned above. Think of this in terms of a cash register. The register prints a receipt. But totaling up of the items from a grocery basket is completely different from the authorization process related to a debit card. So the date slash time recorded on the cash register receipt has nothing to do with the date slash time recorded for the authorization. This was a very similar situation. I hope this makes sense, because this is exactly what I had to explain to our biggest and most complex client. They wanted to know why the date slash time on the statement for their clients often did not reflect the date slash time of the transaction. Why not? In fact, in over half the cases, the date slash time on the statement reflected GMT. Why were most of the transactions set to England time? Each step of the process I mentioned above was captured by the relevant environment as it passed through. It was date slash time stamped and logged according to the settings in that environment. My company always used Eastern US time as the stamp. We also captured the stamp of the terminal as well. This is where we ran into trouble. The terminal's date slash time was supposed to be set to the local time of its physical location during installation. At least that was supposed to happen. Given that the relevant terminals were literally worldwide, my company used that time as the time a transaction happened. That's what appeared on statements, reports, etc. What actually happened was that setting was typically not touched. Given that the default time when shipped was GMT, that was normally the time used by the terminal. So when customers checked their statement, most of the time transactions were displayed in England time. The home base for my client was on the other side of the world to England, literally almost. So not only was the time wrong, but also often the date. Even if the date was set properly, the terminal could be moved too. I saw a few terminals which had clearly been installed at some point in the United States and a few others that had clearly been installed in Western Asia. They were moved to near my client's home base, but the time zone was not changed. This confused and infuriated my client. The first suggested course of action was that we fix this. Sure. Just let me contact a few million people worldwide and have them modify the setting for each terminal, of which we had no ownership and no means to compel this. This was gracefully dismissed as impossible but they still brought it up briefly and bitterly at each meeting, how we should be able to simply fix this, we contemplated using our timestamp, then converting everything from Eastern time to the local time for their home base. However, although 70% of this particular client's transactions occurred in the same time zone near their home base, a fairly large percentage of their clients traveled to nearby countries. A significant percentage were true world travelers. If we converted everything from EST to home base time, that would still be wrong for some thousands of transactions per day. This was dismissed as simply exchanging one problem for another. The only difference here is that our timestamp would now be wrong. The wrong time would now be our fault. Or more accurately more our fault. The one thing I never understood was, what did their previous vendor do? How did they handle this? This was not an unknown issue. It was common in the industry. Somehow their old vendor had hidden this problem from them. It was the only thing that made sense. But how? I could not figure that out. Did the old vendor have some means of matching a terminal to a time zone? They must have, or else my client would have had the same issue. However, they couldn't have, since that was impossible. I'm still baffled by this. Eventually the client stopped complaining. I think they eventually realized there was nothing we could do. So they gave up. Story 2. How Train Simulator Became the Bane of My Life So to preface this I do not work in tech support. There may be many things I do within that could have been solved quicker and more efficiently by a smarter person, but then the story wouldn't be half as long-winded and funny. So my dad is a retired man who doesn't game much, but when he does he loves to play Train Simulator, the old Age of Empire games and surprisingly Colin McRae rally. About two months ago he told me that he had started getting a weird problem. His PC was randomly blue-screening, 
mostly whilst gaming but not always and the problem was intermittent and sometimes didn't happen for weeks and sometimes multiple times a day. This already sounded like my sort of nightmare parent tech support issue but I said I'd help. My only clue was my dad had said that the blue screen mentioned a memory error. This clue ended up being a red herring that lead me down the entirely wrong path. So I headed round with some spare RAM I had and replaced his RAM. A few days later he called to inform me the crash had happened again. My dad also had wanted a bigger hard drive so I decided to get him a new SSD and did a complete reinstall of his system and took his old hard drive out wondering if that was the issue. I'd gotten my hopes up this had worked because I didn't hear anything from him regarding the PC for nearly three weeks. Then it crashed again and I was frustrating back to the drawing board. Eventually my dad was going on holiday for two weeks and I asked him to drop his computer off so I could finally solve this issue. I had to reproduce the error myself I felt because otherwise I just wasn't well educated enough to fix this myself. But if I found out what the error was then Google would be the hero. So I took the PC and unloaded up Age of Empires 2 and got to playing. I played that game for about 3 hours but no crash. Weird. The next day I came back and tried some other games on his PC, including his ancient version of Colin McRae Rally which let me tell you is utterly awful to play with a keyboard and mouse. Still no luck. This was the moment I'd been trying to avoid. I was going to have to actually play Train Simulator to fix this problem. So I steeled myself for the awful experience that was to come and began to play this cursed game. I'll spare you the details because man was not meant to endure that tediousness but I'll say that after a couple of hours the PC finally crashed. Yet it didn't crash to a blue screen like I was expecting, it just turned completely off and even more strangely when I turned it back on it immediately turned back off once it got into Windows. Immediately I thought something in this PC must be overheating, but that's crazy because I cleaned the fans, heat sink and power supply when I installed the new hard drive. Getting to work I installed some heat monitoring software and kept it on display on my second monitor and jumped back into train simulator. It was during some curse turn in some Highland Scottish railroads that I noticed the CPU was starting to get dangerously hot, and sure enough the PC crashed moments later. But the fan was working and clean as was the heat sink. I was nervous the CPU was busted or something because that'd be expensive to fix. But I decided to have a look at the processor physically, though I'm not sure why because it's not like you can eyeball a broken processor and diagnose the problem, but I went ahead anyway. When I unscrewed the heat sink I got a strange surprise. There was absolutely zero thermal paste on the CPU. I don't know if there had been and it had like degraded away, or the company my dad had initially bought this PC from years ago just failed to paste it. In any case there was absolutely no paste. I didn't actually have any paste so I had to wait a day for some to arrive from Amazon, but after that I cleaned the processor, pasted it up and put the PC back together. That's when it depressingly hit me. I was going to have to play Train God Simulator a final time to see if the problem was fixed. After 4 hours of Train Simulator I concluded I had suffered enough and either the problem was fixed or I was giving up. When my dad returned from his holiday I gave him his PC back and told him to keep playing Train Simulator. He told me recently he's been playing an awful lot and not encountered any issues, so I'm nervously putting this down as solved. There's still some mysteries around this that bug me. What was the blue screen my dad saw? Was there actually a memory error I accidentally fixed during all this or did he just get confused? Why was it crashing a lot more frequently and in many computer games for my dad but only train simulator for me? That one I think is because he plays his PC in a roasting hot attic. At least that's the answer that satisfies me. But most importantly of all, the biggest mystery that still haunts me, why the hell do people play train simulator?